Thank you uh, very much for having our paper in the program. Uh, this joint work with Val and Tyler. Uh, so, um, as you know, uh, policy announcements often come with implicit promises. You know, you, you know, markets often expect that if, you know policymakers will do more if things get worse. And there's many recent salient examples of such uh, type of announcements. You know, most prominently, you know, probably the you know the March 20, uh, 20 interventions, the corporate bond market. And of course, this is like policymakers love this because you know you, you promise to do something radical in the future has powerful effects stabilizing price today but you know economists tend to like uh, you know be skeptical they tend to criticize on moral, ha moral hazard uh, excessive risk taking grounds and because of you know the generates pricing or locative distortions so in practice you know these promises are very hard to measure so they're often ignored uh, when you think about policy effects. So what this paper is going to do is try to quantify the state contingent nature of these policies. So we're going to build like a simple framework to understand and quantify these this policy promises. And the key thing that we're going to do is like basically use option prices on specific assets to, to recover what the market thought the Fed was promising uh, or any other policymaker. And we're going to apply this uh, to like a detailed case study of like the 2020 uh, corporate bond uh, intervention. We're also going to look at kind of long-term distortions uh, that these interventions caused. And then, you know, in their paper, we're, we're not going to have time today. We, we go and apply this kind of framework to a bunch of different announcements uh, to document uh, the extent of promises uh, in, in these uh, announcements. So just to give you a flavor of what we get, you know, in March 23, the Fed, you know, announced that they would purchase investment grade corporate bonds. Price increased by 7 to 14 percent, depending on, you know, at which window you look at it. Uh, so that increase in between like half a trillion, one trillion dollar in value. Ultimately, they only purchased 15 billion dollars. So natural questions like, is it like this policy is incredibly effective? Or, or, or there was some implicit promise, right? And what we, we're going to find is that there was like a lot of in, in, implicit promise in the sense that the Fed was expected to do substantially more if things were to get worse, right? What I'm, plot, I'm plotting here is the, the basically the price support that the Fed was expected to give in these different states of the world, which here, we, we, you know, if you do the ratio of these things, implies basically five times more you know, price support in bad states relative to kind of the basic <coughs> state of the distribution. So, um, so what we're going to do, let, let me give you like a simple example. Think about an announcement date zero purchase at date one, and then you have a pre-announcement, you have prices P0 and P1, and P0 is just a you know, risk neutral expectation of P1, and then at the announcement, you announce some quantity Q, um, and that Q is going to, you know, impact, you know, uh, price P1 and through this risk neutral expectation in in impacts the price uh, today, right? So M here is the fact in effectiveness of the policy. Uh, we are agnostic about it, but, you know, one mechanism that you could think about it is like the Fed is going to, you know, uh, absorb assets from specialists and that's going to lower risk premium for the, from date one onwards, right? So if you apply this view, that's basically kind of the, the, the conditional, you know, like the unconditional promise, and you apply that to the numbers that we, that we saw in the data, you have like a purchase of $15, trillion, $15 billion and an effect of like between uh, half a trillion and one trillion dollar, you get this crazy high multiplier between 30 and 60, right? Which is, you know, uh, very, very, would be very, very powerful uh, policy, right? So... Stop moving. Um, okay. Going back. Okay. So um, so now with promises, you know, the Fed instead of like saying, "Look, I'm going to buy some unconditional amount," it has some state contingent promise that it would buy more if things would uh, get worse. You know, so if price goes, for example, below a threshold, and then uh, and then you now the effect of the policy is just like the. You know, the probability of that you reach that state of the world times, uh, you know, the, the quantity that you're promising that state. So, for example, if you have a ratio uh, of Q promise to, to the unconditional Q of 5 and the probability is 20%, that will be doubling the announcement response, right? And obviously, you know, uh, these this promises are already priced in, right? When they actually happen, uh, when the, the quantities are actually purchased, there's no effect uh, because this was already priced in the market.
So what our framework is going to do is try to like recover this price support function G, okay? Uh, and then you know the, the key idea is that this policy is not a fixed number, but some mapping from state of the world to the to what the Fed is going to do. And uh, we are going to focus on basically on price space. That is the state is going to be the values of the asset absent intervention. And we're going to recover what the Fed would do in these different uh, states of the world. Okay? Now, um, G does not separate M from Q, right? The policy effectiveness from, from the quantity. Uh, to do that, we're going to do that, but you need more. Uh, we're going to have to, to put more on the table to get there. Okay? So what, how are we going to recover G from the data? I mean, first, you know, the conditional Z, uh, G is obvious, just like the, the announcement effect. And then, uh, and then the, you know, we're gonna, the key idea that the paper is going to do is just use the, the distribution of, of prices that you can get from options to recover uh, this uh, price support function G. Okay? So uh, the assumption that we're going to need is basically you know, there is an existence of a risk neutral distribution that maps prices at the you know, implementation stage to the prices at the announcement stage. And um, and then later we, we will you know uh, fl you know uh, uh, generalize that a little bit okay so and and we also need that the policies are preserving that is the, the Fed is not going to do so much in a bad state that this bad state is going to be actually better than some other uh, some some other state so so that that's also important to get a unique uh, price support function. Right? So, and then what you do is like simple, right? You have Britain Litzenberger be, before an announcement, uh, before and after the, the announcement, and then you get these two state price densities, and then map one to the other, right? It's basically uh, 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 you're mapping the X percentile of the distribution uh, before the announcement into the X percentile of the distribution after the announcement, and that gives you uh, the price uh, support function G, okay? So, um, so, and so we're going to apply this uh, to a bunch of events, but you know, today we're going to talk mostly about this particular event. Here is basically uh, you know, the underlying effects, uh, what happened when the March uh, 23 announcement. You, you see like the, the investment grade ETF going up 7% uh, in the one day. If you look at three days, it's at 14%. We're going to focus on the one day return here for, for the talk. Uh, and if we do that through this machinery, you get uh, this price support function uh, G that, uh, that, for example, it says that if the prices would have dropped 20%, the Fed would push prices uh, by 20% uh, in that state of the world. Okay? Now, and, and, uh, now you know, one way to quantify like, how big a deal is this is to imagine uh, what, what if the policy was flat uh, after the medium. Right, that is, suppose that instead of like keep promising more and more, the Fed kept the, the same promise as it had in the, in the medium state, then uh, prices would be, you know, the, 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 re the return at the announcement would be 50% lower instead of 7%, something like 3.5%, right? That's telling you that promises uh, were, were a very big part of the announcement. Um, now, um, now we are interested uh, also in understanding the quantities. Uh, for that, you need to make more assumptions. So one reasonable assumption is to think about M as constant, right? If M is constant, G is informative about relative quantities. And then, and then uh, so in this case, it's like about five. And then you can think about the realized path to extract the M, right? In this particular case, they bought 0.2% of the market cap uh, and then if you uh, go through the, the fact that it had in markets, that's an aim of about eight. And that can, you know, with this calculation, this basic calculation tells you how much you would have the federal expected to buy if the market would drop, let's say, 30%, the market, the, the federal expected to buy about 5% of the market cap. Alternatively, you can think about a, a, a view that Q is actually fixed. They always promise the same, but the multiplier is varying with the state, right? Uh, so in this case, it gives you a very implausible uh, 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 multiplier that, you know, in the, the bad state of the world, the Fed would be expected to buy uh, uh, what would be uh, the effectiveness of the policy would be like 200, right? So each 1% that you buy, you end up boosting prices by 200%, uh, percent, right? Uh, now, 
you might think, what about the SDF effects? The first thing that you might be concerned is like maybe there's like broad macro SDF effects, right? That the, the announcement uh, uh, is driving some you know, hip, you know general re, generic, generic repricing of risk. So um, you know, high yield and SP 500 basically will flat or fall during the window, which cut, cut across this field. And you know, what, what they also do in the paper is think about an endogenous uh, SDF. Uh, that basically SDF, it's like the SDF of a specialist. And then if you do that, uh, you basically you, you construct a numerary equivalent uh, 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 um, density, and then and this gives gives allows you to recover the the, the basically the, the, the risk adjusted uh, effect of the policy, and you still get this very uh, known, you know, this very. Uh, uh, asymmetric response where the Fed was expected to do significantly more in these states, even if you, uh, you know, uh, allow for the fact that, you know, these uh, this markets might be specialist heavy. So uh, now, if you buy, um, now, you know, um, if you buy what we did so far, now we, we can ask, we can go even further and try to think about what, what states of the world the Fed was expected to buy, right? Was it expected to buy in states of like very high credit risk or in states of very high interest rates or, or states of very high dislocation, right? For that, we construct basically, we want to recover uh, the, the, the state price density of the basis, right? Uh, and of course, this is a, is a difficult object to get our, our hands on. So what we're going to do, we're going to use options both on you know, the, 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 the corporate bonds, on credit indexes, and on treasuries to, to recover the density of the, the basis. And then we're going to you know, use a couple of methods. And we're going to you know, use conservative correlation to relate uh, this, these objects. And what you find is basically most of the action is in the shrinkage of, of the, 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 the tail risk in the basis, right? It seems that the market was expecting the Fed to intervene more heavily if these locations were to get worse, okay? Um, right. So um, now uh, pivoting to, uh, to discuss uh, long-term uh, Distortions in the corporate bond market. I'm just gonna give you uh, uh, a little uh, flavor of what we did here. Of course, that's a very hard question, you know. But ultimately, what you want to know is that if the fact that you made, you know, this intervention today, this, you know, changed uh, in behavior of, of investors in a way that leads to mispricing of, of uh, credit risk going forward. Okay. But of course, you know, what is the benchmark relative to what? You know, uh, it, 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 there's no uh, very clean answer here. What we're going to do is to try to see if there was a, a decoupling of the tail risk uh, and risk pricing in corporate bond markets relative to other markets that they used to be related. In particular, we look at, we're going to show today just the, the equity uh, tail risk, but we also look at CDS tail risk. We look at correlation of corporate bonds with VIX. And we also look at, you know, Pietro and Paltors have, uh, you know, the pseudo spreads. And we also look at and, uh, this. And all this uh, stuff is basically pointed the same direction that, you know, the, 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 the announcement of these interventions created a disconnect in the, the price of tail risk in the, in the corporate bond market relative uh, to this other, uh, either the equity market or the CDS market. Okay? So, and here what that is, you know, the, the, that's one of the regressions that we run. You know, we, we are just look, look running a time series regression of the tail risk on the corporate bond, on the tail risk on the S&P 500. And then, uh, uh, and then you see first without like the COVID interaction, you see that the, the you know, the, the intervention greatly reduced uh, the, the, you know, the correlation between the, the tail risk of the corporate bond and uh, and the S&P 500, and then if you even if you, if you interact with COVID, we, we see that obviously you know COVID drove like a massive increase in this correlation, uh, but um, but you 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 get the, the same measure uh, you know message that we know the post intervention uh, greatly reduce uh, this correlation. Okay, so um, now um, now we can. So in the paper, we're going to go and look at these other things. Of course, here we want to be careful. We, you know, those things are not um, 
you know, they, they suggested that the, 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 the investors started uh, thinking about corporate bond markets differently about the, after the intervention. Now, um, of course, there's many, many announcements. In fact, you know, the, the, the paper was, thought, was motivated by, you know, kind of the, 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 the draggy uh, announcement back in the, the, the financial, in the European crisis. So, and then what, what we do, we, 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 we do this, um, uh, we do other things, but you know, here what I'm showing to you is this the composition of how much, for each of these announcements, right, how much is coming from promises of do more uh, if things get worse. And the, what we're, and, and the fractal spending by promises is exactly constructed doing this calculation that makes the, the price support function flat to the left of the median of the distribution, okay? And then, uh, and all these events, well, some of the events get like sub very substantial uh, promises. For example, you know, the, the Paulson plan that promised to, you know, to, you know, to, to, you know, to, to inject uh, uh, equity capital on, on, the, on the banks. Uh, there is obviously, you know, the, the events related to the drag announcement. First, you know, just his whatever state, uh, whatever take, takes speech, the, you know, that gets 90%, that's, you know, honestly for us, that was like disappointing, was uh, very small, I guess. But then uh, August 2 and September 6 is then when, you know, they announced the actual implementation of what, you know, his uh, speech meant, and that, uh, and then you, you, you find substantial uh, promises uh, there as well. Um, we also look at uh, you know um, ja you know events in Japan, and now we're looking at Australia and and, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, so the paper ha ha has more. We also look at the the, the Fed announcement, uh, Fed announcements. But for today, uh, I wanted to just keep at uh, you know kind of the main uh, message of the paper. So um, so let me conclude. Um, so. There is, you know, I think there's promises playing a very big role on, you know, uh, this very important policy announcement that we happened, uh, you know, in the last few years. Uh, and we, we show that we can measure this using option prices. And we find, for example, for this uh, March uh, 23 announcement that there was an implicit promise to, to do at five times more uh, if things were to get worse. And, uh, and this has very big impacts on announcement returns. You know, about 50% of the announcement return is coming from this action in the left tail. Uh, so uh, we do find that this has long-term consequences that creates a, you know, a, a disconnect between uh, corporate uh, bond pricing and uh, other assets. Uh, and we, when we show that this, you know, these promises are, are playing a role on a, on a variety of announcements as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. The discussion is Nina Boyerchenko. Great. Um, thanks for having me to discuss this paper. Um, as always, the views are my own and not the views of the bank or of the reserve system. So I'm not going to spend much time uh, recapping what Alan just talked about, um, but I just want to tell you what I think are is the basic idea in this paper, as well as what are the crucial assumptions that Alan and his co-authors need to actually get this machinery working. So the basic idea, um, as Alan said at the beginning, is to use changes in option pricing around announcements of different kinds of interventions to evaluate market beliefs about the extent of the amount of those interventions actually happening. Now, the crucial assumption in all of their machinery is that when we get an announcement like the announcement of the corporate credit facilities, what changes is the physical distribution of future outcomes, but not the attitudes towards those outcomes. So meaning that we can look at how the option and pride distribution of outcomes changes around announcement dates and attribute those changes to <laughs> changes in possible outcomes rather than changes in the SDF. So then uh, if we make that assumption, 
If we have this conditional price impact function, we can extract a conditional purchase size. And um, as Alan discussed, most of the paper is going to apply this machinery to the corporate credit facilities. So what I want to talk to you about today are, again, three key aspects in uh, what they're doing. So the first is, can we really think about these as just being changes in the physical distribution? The second thing I want to think about is when we have an announcement like the corporate credit facility, even if we're changing the physical distribution, what are we changing the physical distribution of? And finally, I want to circle back and think about to what extent we can actually rely on option prices in uh, these kinds of contexts. OK, so um, as I think we all know, uh, when we work with option prices, what we can recover from, uh, most directly from options are risk-neutral distributions. So when we see the risk-neutral risk distribution changing around a particular date, those changes can be coming from either changes in the physical distribution, changes in the SDF, or changes in both. Now, this, la uh, this uh, last version is usually what we would assume in option pricing, right? So when the price of an S&P 500 option moves, we usually think about that, uh, of that as reflecting both changes in risk aversion and changes in possible uh, future outcomes for the level of, this, of the S&P 500. Now, as we just saw, the paper uh, focuses on the assumption that um, this change is going to be coming from the physical distribution only. And um, I mean, I know Alan showed us some, uh, uh, some results that may suggest that the STF isn't moving. I'm actually going to uh, try to argue that that's probably not reasonable. And there are a few ways of thinking about this. So here is a very simple, very naive way of trying to think through what actually happens around various CCF announcements in March, in spring 2020, excuse me. The three event lines that I have in the charts are March 22nd, which is the announcement of the facilities, April 9th, which is the expansion to include fallen angels, and uh, May 16th, which is the first day that ETFs were actually purchased by the facilities. And what I'm plotting here are the one year ahead average uh, expected default frequencies of the bonds that are actually held by LQD, which is Allen's and his co-authors preferred investment grade measure, the high yield ETF, and then the fallen angel ETF, or like one of the biggest fallen angel ETFs. And as you can see, if we're looking at LQD, the expected default frequency of LQD essentially doesn't change around any of these announcements. Now, for something like the high yield and the angel ETF, you do see a decline in the expected default frequency starting around the announcement dates. But um, in the paper, when the paper talks about, let's say, the high yield ETF, they're talking about the April 9th date, not um, the March 22nd date, which is the original announcement. Now, you can, you can slice this in many different ways. Um, in a paper I have with a couple of my colleagues, we looked at, you know, bond by bond changes in the, in the expected default frequency as compared to changes in default adjustment spreads. You definitely see bigger changes in default adjusted spreads than EDF. If you compare how much of the overall ret retracement in spreads is coming from the default adjusted component versus the expected default component, most of it is coming from uh, the default adjusted component. Again, sort of suggestive that a lot of what's happening to spreads around this time is about risk attitudes, not about the quantity of risk. You can go even <laughs> more in depth into how people were actually trading around this time. So here I'm showing you the cumulative net inventory change for 
bank affiliated dealers on the left hand side, non bank affiliated dealers on the right hand side. And again, in the paper, we basically show that the non bank affiliated dealers exited a lot of the, uh, a lot of, uh, the corporate bond market, and in particular the high yield market at the start of the pandemic and only re entered once the purchases started. Again, very suggestive of the risk attitudes in this market actually changing during this period, um, and not just the physical distribution changing at the same time. Okay, so um, suppose that we do accept that what's happening is that a physical distribution is actually changing around this time. Um, if we talk about the corporate credit facilities, in particular, we need to think through what it actually means for the Federal Reserve to be able to intervene in these markets. Um, the, the authority for something like the CCF comes from the, the so-called third and three lending authority. And the key piece of this for us as economists is that this authority specifically states that the Federal Reserve Bank has to show that you know, private corporations or all non-financial corporations in this particular case are unable to secure adequate credit accommodation. Now, what that means is that the third and three facilities legally can only do interventions to restart access to primary credit markets. Um, again, in the paper, the, um, Alan and his co-authors assume that that's essentially equivalent to uh, trimming, uh, well, to being able to intervene when NTF prices are low. Um, can we think of the two as being equivalent? I'm not sure. Uh, there, and there are a few reasons for why, you know, a very low price on LQD is not quite the same thing as non-financials not being able to, um, to access the corporate bond market. I mean, the most obvious one that we probably all know about is the ETF NAV basis. We know that ETFs are not exactly valued at the same price as the underlying bonds. So you can have a price in, uh, change in the price of the ETF without the um, uh, underlying bond portfolio actually being impacted. Um, in terms of the composition of ETFs, an ETF portfolio is not quite the same thing necessarily the same thing as the set of non-financials you're trying to support. Um, and finally, again, we all know that primary and secondary markets are connected, but they're not synchronous. So you can have changes in secondary market prices without corresponding changes in primary market access and vice versa. Um, just to give you an idea of some of these cons uh, potential issues, um, I, what I'm showing you here is the number of bonds that are included in either LQD, so the investment grade, or the high yield ETF, um, and the overlap between those bonds and the bonds that were included in the broad market index that was used by the corporate credit facilities as actually the basket of bonds that had to be bought. Um, so the green area in the top two charts are bonds in uh, the broad market index, bonds in the BMI that are not in the ETF. The blue area are the bonds in the corresponding ETF that are not in the BMI. And the red is the overlap. And you can see that even for LQD, which is supposed to be the investment grade index, the overlap is very small, partially because um, when, uh, in terms of the individual bond purchases, there was a five-year maturity cap, partially because um, LQD does hold non-investment grade bonds, partially because LQD also holds um, bonds issued by uh, banks and bank-affiliated companies, which again were not included in the facility purchases. Um, and finally, in the bottom panel, um, I'm showing you the time series chart of what the facility actually purchased. 
Um, yes, for the first month, because of speed to market, the facility was only purchasing ETFs. But then as soon as the facility was able to start purchasing bonds, um, the relative volume of ETF drops, um, and it drops much quicker um, than the purchases of corporate bonds. And similarly, I don't have the chart here, but in terms of the exit, the facility first exited from, uh, from the ETF portfolios and then exited from uh, the corporate bond portfolios last summer. Again, really quickly, primary markets, not the same thing as secondary markets. Um, this is a chart showing you that in terms of the primary market offering spread for investment grade bonds, it took much longer to normalize than the, than the secondary market spread. Again, very suggestive of the fact that, you know, even if we do believe that options give you, the changes in option prices can give you changes in physical distributions, you're not necessarily looking at the right, uh, the distribution of the right thing. So in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk about the liquidity of the options that we're using. Um, and um, one way of looking at that is to just compare uh, the put volume um, for these ET uh, for options on these ETFs with the put volume on S&P 500. Um, so even just in terms of the number of contracts traded, LQD has many few contracts traded, um, and that's not taken into, into account that these S&P 500 options have a bigger notional than the LQD notional has. Um, similarly, for the high yield, um, we can zoom in and look at the three months options that get used in the paper. Again, much lower volume for LQD than S&P 500, much lower volume for high yield. So then when we go out and look at what actually gets uh, at the volume that corresponds to the implied volatility charts in the paper, I don't know. To me, this doesn't look like a super liquid market, so we probably want to be a little bit careful in terms of how we interpret um, the actual movements and the applied volatility uh, from this market. Um, one other thing, um, the paper does also look at um, CDX options. Um, so CDX options are a relatively new asset class since the financial crisis. To some extent, they're supposed to be replacing um, the CDX tranche product that was very popular pre-crisis. But again, the volumes are not really there. And the spikes that you see in the volumes are actually corresponding to <coughs> roles of the index itself, not, um, not actually a particular economic event days. So um, in the last couple of minutes, just to wrap up, I do think that it's an interesting approach to uh, measuring market expectations of the size of interventions. <clears throat> but I do think that the paper needs to think more carefully about the split between how much is moving because the fiscal distribution is moving versus how much is moving be because risk aversion uh, is changing at the same time. Now, um, I, I, you know, again, there are many kind of floating pieces that you have to be on board with when you uh, do this estimation. I would urge uh, Alan and his co-authors to really think about whether they're looking at the right proxy for interventions and um, uh, to think more carefully about the liquidity of the options that they're using. Does that mean that we should discard this paper altogether? Well, no, I just think that there are better applications for uh, the type of methodology that they have. So again, the basic issue is that when you just use option prices, you have to take a stand on whether it's the expectations that are moving or risk aversion that is moving. So if you have a, <laughs> application where you have another observation for one of these two objects, then you can actually take all of this machinery and think carefully about what it, uh, um, about the market expectations of these conditional promises. 
Now, luckily, uh, the survey of primary dealers actually collects expectations from uh, primary dealers in the US about essentially OSAPs. Uh, so here's a snapshot from the March 2022 survey. As you can see, essentially, that question is um, asking primary dealers for the expectations of how much um, the Fed balance sheet is going to change both in terms of treasuries and agency MPS over a particular horizon. Um, the public results for the survey will give you both the median path as well as the 25th and 75th percentile. And so essentially every FOMC meeting, you do get a measure of market expectations for the future path of LSAPs or reverse LSAPs at this point in time, and you can combine that with treasury options to, um, uh, to actually back out what you need. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much, Nina. Um, let's take some questions, and then um, Alan can respond. Cassandra? One question, Alan. Is, um, whether your machinery can be used also for uh, uh, announcement in reverse. So right now the Fed is promising, he has a central scenario, is promising to do whatever it takes to bring inflation down. Would that, would this machinery be helpful in that context? And the second question related to what Nina was saying, uh, on March uh, 23, like, uh, in 2020, a lot of other interventions, so how do we control in this framework for confounding factors? Should I take a few or answer? Answer one at a time. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, absolutely. You can do a reverse for them. The taper tantrum is one event that we look at the opposite of, and that's, we definitely can do that. Uh, the second thing, yeah, I mean, it's an event study in the end of the day. There's no like magic here. It's like you zoom in as much as you can and you focus on that effect. Um, but but yeah, I mean, if there's other expectations that what we are, we are, we are trying to, to do it is like in the papers, like showing that whatever was happening wasn't having like broad effects in financial markets at that tight uh, event window, right? Um, that that's what we do in the paper. Yeah, Stefan. Question on the maturity of the option. So you didn't talk. I, 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 maybe I missed it, but uh, it would be kind of interesting to explore the timing of the because you have an announcement, right? Then the policy gets enacted some date, right? So presumably there's some, and you have transaction of options, right? So yeah. you can think about. You're looking at options that expire just before, just after. Yeah. So here we, we took, you know, we used three months because uh, it turned out to be like where, you know, most liquidity is of this option and when the policies actually started to be implemented. So, and then that's where we thought like in the framework, that's what we kind of want to measure is like when the policy actually happened because you know the state of the world there and that's why we choose, but there's certainly room to think about maturity, particularly in other events like QE, uh, yeah, and think about the, the option maturity uh, uh, term structure uh, more uh, there, absolutely. Yeah, Maria. Uh, so on your last slide, uh, the share of the um, expectations relative to the uh, immediate action, it varied a lot, one policy to another. Did you look at what, mark, like, in which cases it's very big, in which cases it's small? There are like certain macro conditions for that? Or? Right, uh, yeah, these events are all very different. I, I, I don't really, we, we haven't. Uh, I mean, some stuff like, for example, we started with the whatever it takes speech, right, from Draghi. There, there's not much in that particular event window, but then if you look uh, later, so it's kind of like, why is that? I, I don't really know. I mean, that's the, but, but yeah, it's, you could think about parsing text and try to explain with what exactly they said. I don't know. Any other questions or can I? Can you explain the, uh, uh, the, the risk premium point I, I want to ask you about? So yeah. the, um, let me ask you like this. So at some level your channel, it seems to me kind of has to be about risk premium. Um, so, but, but you're also kind of claiming or trying to control for it. So, so, so can you just clarify that? Yeah, uh, great. I mean, of course we very much believe that risk premium effects were the most important things that happened in March 20. We, we wrote a whole paper about that, right? So I want to be very clear on this. So what the assumption, the main, you know, the baseline assumption says that is changing the natural distribution of 
P1, right? It's not like the mapping from fundamentals, the four risks, back to prices, right? It's just between P0 and P1. That's the, you know, uh, the main assumption that you make. And then, of course, the main mechanism is how this M would impact, for example, the, the key thing that we think about is like the Fed takes stuff from balance sheet of dealers and that uh, reduces risk premium going forward, right? So it's a very much a risk uh, premium effect, right? So we don't, uh, you know, there, there's no, I, I don't know exactly what, we probably have to like write better the paper, you know, I think, you know, how we are thinking about this didn't uh, come across to Nina. Uh, now, uh, so, and then one concern that you have that we are thinking is like, well, maybe there's broad, uh, SDF effects that unrelated to actually the quantity purchase, right? You have an announcement that shifts the equilibrium, something that's like is operating not through the act of purchases, right? And that's in the sense that we are like controlling chain look, it doesn't look like broad macro uh, SDF effects that are like driving this response. That's one. And then this, the, the second one that you're saying, like, look, if this market uh, uh, you know, that if you have, if you think a little harder, you will say like, sure, maybe it's not broad market effects, but if it is a, a segmented market, if you think about Venus and Villa, for example, then the way that this would work is exactly by changing, you know, the, the, from day to one forward, you change the risk premium that uh, this uh, specialist required to hold this asset, right? And that's exactly how we think about that. Of course, you know, the, the framework doesn't tell that that's what is happening, but that we our preferred interpretation of what's going on. Okay. But why would it change it from P1 forward, but not from P0 to P1? Right. No. So in the baseline assumption, we, we have to. That's what we can recover. And then you can say, well, Alan, in Vianna's deal, actually, when you change the natural distribution of P1 because of risk premium from P1 going forward, you actually change the risk from zero to one to the specialist, right? And then, and then you should risk adjust. And that's what we do with, the, with the, what we call the quasi-structure, uh, quasi-structural uh, risk adjustment that basically you, you, you are endowing some special use with log, uh, basically log utility. And from that, that you can recover uh, from options as well what is the, you know, the, the, the effect of conditional policy if you have the SDF of a specialist. With this particular uh, so that that's what we we, we, we do there. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Just like in terms of the uh, drawing thing with the, if you think of sovereign debt and you think maybe like the equilibrium could change if you announce something and let's say you actually don't do anything, right? Which is kind of what happened in that situation. Right. Like what? Where does How that do you from? know that, that you don't know, right? You're, you're just imposing, but but okay, uh, we, we don't know. I mean, he, we might promise something, no, you no, know, no. that didn't actually happen, right? Yeah, I'm not saying that. Yeah, it's not a critique. I'm asking, like, yeah. so the actual purchase was zero, but there's some promise, let's say, and then we think we eliminate some bad equilibrium. Right. Where does that show up in what you're doing? Like, I yeah. don't think it's quite the SDF. It's kind of physical. It, it's partly physical. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I think that would be a confounder here. I mean, to, to the extent that this is, for example, in our main specification, we would try to get at that in a very reduced form way by looking at all the assets that were not directly targeted, but would be impacted by the shift in equilibrium. For example, the high yield bonds, right? But it's, it is, um, we don't have, the framework doesn't tell you how to do that. It's gonna be like event specific that you're gonna have to be thoughtful and say, look, what's the, the shifting equilibrium view would predict about these other assets that are not that targeted off the intervention. Did they respond consistently with that, okay? That, that's what we do. Uh, for the, for, for that, that's how I would, we would approach this, but yeah. Uh, any other questions? Can I? Uh, yeah. Can I? Uh, so yeah. So a couple. So I guess I already answered the, the the thing that I think is the biggest kind of like I think misunderstanding that happened here between the, this issue of like if it's risk premium or natural. We obviously you know believe very much that things work through risk premium. Now you know this issue of like the LQD not being a good proxy. I don't really understand that LQD. I mean they bought a lot of investment grade ETF. I mean. Pre you know, Nina showed that was the book of what they bought. And of course, you know, we can discuss like S&P 500 versus the total market, but of course, LQD holds like by market cap, most of this market anyways, 
So N is where you know we can actually measure stuff. So I don't quite you know under, I maybe I should think a bit more, but I, I really don't get that point. Now in terms of liquidity, I mean it's true. I mean most of stuff is way less liquid than S and P 500 options. Like. About, about almost everything <laughs> that we look at. If we have this criteria that we're gonna have the only use options that are like more than 10% of like trading volume of S&P, I mean, we're I mean, not gonna do very much. I, I don't know, I, I, that's what I, I, I don't know how to, I think, yeah, it's true. It's less liquid than S&P 500, but S&P 500 market is very liquid market. I mean, it's probably the, one of the most liquid out there, so. Uh, Anyways, but thank you very much for the discussion, Nina. Um, um, and yeah, we had memories from our PhD days. <laughs> <laughs>